So I'm Rick Campbell and uh, have seen some of you for years and uh, uh, met some of you today and just delighted to be here. And uh, this is my daughter, Anna, um, K K7XNA. Anna, Anna is a real person. She has a general class license and has participated in a lot of, uh, of on the air activities. So, uh, and just um, a professional artist. Uh, I'm an I'm an engineer artist, and Anna is an artist engineer. And I, when whenever I do a project with her, I'm just blown away with her contributions. To, and we'll talk about some of that in in a minute here. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, pass along some greetings. Um, a designer that I just admire through the roof. Uh, somebody that was standing around, and he had this crowd of people around him um, and they were just gushing about all his contributions and and he was uh, an older gentleman and he said well when I die I want to be judged by the quality of my friends and he said whoa yeah I got to remember that one so uh so first first off um two of my friends that I saw just uh well, in February, late February, I saw Wes Hayward and Roy Llewellyn, and they knew I was going to be here. And so Wes and Roy both pass on on their greetings to uh, to this crowd. And uh, uh, I've I've been a professor half my career and a design and engineer, IC designer the other half, and a scientist for a little bit. But my last gig as a as an IC designer, I was working with this this older gentleman, and uh, we had lots of heated discussions in his office uh, to where people said, but but are you friends? And I would say, oh, man, I'm never sure. Um, and he, he, he has now passed on, but I, I bring you greetings from Barry Gilbert, um, who uh, I had the honor of working with and uh, was an, an amazing man who understood the insides of a transistor better than than anybody I've ever in, encountered. So uh, so that's a few of my friends. And here's another one of my old friend, actually our old friend, Brian Bowers. Um, I, I don't always wear the uh, the ham radio hat. Sometimes I wear, uh, wear a musician hat and sometimes an instrument maker hat and whatnot. But Brian's been a friend of mine for forever um, since, since he was a young man. Um, and uh, Brian was doing this song one time. And I said, oh man, I, I don't think Brian wrote that song. Um, and uh, he he didn't, a great singer songwriter wrote it, but yeah, starts out, well, the whole thing started because it looked like fun. Other people got a dog. I think I'll get me one. And so so that's the introduction to this talk. Um, it It just all started because it looked like fun. I was teaching a class it had a pod, uh, project requirement. <clears throat> I had a student, uh, the student on the left there, Kelly Dickens had just gotten her tech license. And she said, is it okay if I do something having to do with amateur radio for my project? And I thought about that for two picoseconds and, and said, yeah, yeah, let's, you know, let's, let's talk about that. And so what she did was really, really cool. She'd built a crystal set and picked up an AM radio station. And she said, can I do a crystal set for two meters? And I said, oh yeah, cool. So she took a folded dipole at the, where the two ends come together, she put a, a diode. She actually took the one out of her AM crystal set and put a diode there, used the same little ceramic earphone. And I had a two meter uh, MCW transmitter that put out a fair amount of power. We put that across the lab keyed it and she was able to to hear this two meter modulated cw station on her little folded dipole and then she turned around and she said oh yeah and i can see the nulls well nicole the other student um who had even more recently got her text li license says i want to do that and so we expanded the project into hidden transmitter hunting on on two meters and I got to try some things that I've wanted to try forever. So Anna, um, 
yeah, yeah, hold hold that uh, experimental antenna up. And if you want to say a few words about it, you can. Um, great design here. Each of the elements can just easily move into the boom and break apart so that they fit into the boom. And then you can actually use this handy dandy extension ability of it to tune it. And so, yeah, handy dandy, not the most aesthetically pleasing <laughs> design uh, ever, that, but, that's <laughs> but very cool. So, so yeah. And, and the, the thing that's not obvious from that, I mean, it's really not obvious because it kind of looks kind of clunky is that was like after a year of development by me um, and, and with contributions from Kelly, mostly from Kelly and Nicole, but there was something I had always wanted to try since my early days as a baby QR peer. Um, and I've always been interested in VHF and I went into a kite store because we've got kites on the coast of, uh, of Oregon and uh, they had these tiny little kite sticks, carbon fiber type kite sticks. And I said, Oh, that's perfect. I can get kite materials and use those to make a little two meter Yagi that suspends the wires between, you know, make a Yagi and suspend the wires between. And it's something that's been appeared over and over in my notebooks for at least 20 years. And so finally I had an excuse to, to do it. And I got these kite sticks and it put wires strung between them. And I made this little thing that, um, if you were doing a summits of the air thing, you could hike up there and you'd have all these little pieces and it would only take you a few hours to get it to all assembled. Um, but I took it out to my backyard range and tried it out. And there are all kinds of youthful expressions for the performance and I won't use any of them, um, but it didn't, it's, its performance was disappointing. <laughs> And it took me, I don't know, took me a month of working with this before I realized that carbon fiber kite sticks are just conductive enough that it's like putting a, a hundred ohm resistor in parallel with every element, you know, tightly coupled. And the thing just, and then I did the experiment that I should have done first. Um, and I, I cut a little two inch length of carbon fiber type kite stick and set it on top of a paper cup, put it on the microwave oven, set it for 10 seconds. After five seconds, there were flames shooting out of the end of it. So, so if you're ever in like that Steven Seagal movie where you need to put something in the microwave oven so when the power comes up, it blows up a bomb, a, a two inch length of carbon fiber kite stick is the perfect way to do that, so so you learned something today. Um, anyway, we we built these antennas. I had a couple of them, and we assembled them, and it took us less than two hours. But um, but they had a lot of fun putting the antennas together. Uh, we started off with a, uh, a slightly stronger Morse transmitter, and discovered that uh, about 100 microwatts of carrier is just about right for hiding a transmitter out in the woods. And then having having uh, um, Anna Anna and Nicole and Kelly and some other people go off and look look for them with these uh, these two meter um, antennas and uh, and they and it was just it was just a blast. I mean, we just had a lot of fun with it. So there's Nicole out hidden transmitter hunting in the woods, and this photograph was picked up by the IEEE and reproduced in the International Microwave Symposium program. So this is what 10,000 microwave engineers think of when they think of amateur radio. <laughs> and, and I mean, looking out at this crowd, that's not quite right, but, <laughs> but definitely, um, I mean, Nicole is great. Um, Nicole built a, a built a CMOS iambic keyer as another one of her projects, only she's a brilliant electrical engineer. And I said, you can't do that. This, my classes are all analog. We do things at the component level. And she said, oh, oh no, no, no. I already bought 
all the N and PMOS transistors. So she built CMOS logic from scratch, individual trend, and built an iambic here. And it was, if you saw the, uh, the modular bench this morning photograph, it was that big <laughs> and it almost worked, um, it, but it was really cool. Um, so, so it took her about 15 minutes to find the transmitter and, uh, and it was a lot of fun. Some things we learned in those experiments. Um, you want to track beacons with a receiver in AM mode because all the modern modes we do are designed so that for communications, so that you, you can't tell how strong the signal is. On an FM radio, you can't tell how strong the signal is. Uh, digital modes, it's either there or it's not. Um, if it's there, it's probably somebody you didn't really want to talk to anyway. Uh, most phone calls these days are ignored. Um, and, and if it's not there, this, it's just not there. So you want to be in AM. We tried a milliwatt. That was too loud. Uh, 100 microwatts is about right. And the two meter direction finding antennas, uh, there, go ahead and pull that out to the, tune it to the beacon frequency. So it's right out there. Um, okay, now Anna, if, if you would just walk up and down a few of these aisles and poke out people's eyes. It's, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, they're, they're fine, but they're, they're unwieldy. And, uh, yeah, it's it's just uh, um, they work well, but and I was so proud of that design. I just I, you know after after twenty years of sketches, I finally came up with a a two meter collapsible antenna that would fit inside the plastic tube that also serves as a boom. I mean, how clever is that? I I I, I amaze myself. Um, <laughs> but so the. So the other thing is you really want to listen to the radio, the received signal, not look at a bar graph. I'm going to hand it over to Anna because she, she'll describe what happened. <laughs> oh, yeah. When, yep, you want to use all your senses uh, at your disposal. We had one individual go out to try to find the transmitter, staring at that bar graph, getting closer here, you know, really really involved in just looking at the screen and got right up on the transmitter, which was on top of a fence post and just couldn't find it. Couldn't find it. Walking around the fence post, still nothing. Came back, was like, I don't know where it is. So you wanna, you wanna use all of the, your senses um, at your disposal. <laughs> and, and meanwhile, the rest of us are standing like a hundred yards away and and watching this and and trying to stop what's that word rolling on the floor of laughing yeah. uh, we were just trying to keep from laughing because you know this was a serious person that was out there and we didn't want to ridicule them but uh, but we learned a lesson and and one of the lessons is just put the radio in am mode and look around and listen you can hear when the signal gets stronger um our our hidden transmitter hunt days on the farm were just a blast. I mean, we just played around with these antennas and anybody that came by, we would hand, you know, hide the somewhere out, else out in the woods, hand them an antenna. And then at the end of the day, we cooked burgers on the grill. And it was just, I mean, a, a hidden transmitter hunt picnic is just, just delightful. And we discovered something. Um, the, the best range to keep these is, is close enough that somebody can find one in about 15 minutes and then wander back and then hand, you know, hide them again. So, so we came up with this, this rule that we use for these picnic hidden transmitter hunts, 200 meters and down. And, and that just seemed, it kind of rang a bell. It just seemed like it was perfect for amateur radio. So, at, at the end of our last um, hidden transmitter hunt, I had built a little one for 432 on the same rectangular or square plastic boom. And I made the mistake of showing it to Anna, Nicole, and Kelly. And they all oohed and odd a little bit, except Nicole, who just 
looked at it for a while and finally said, it's so cute. <laughs> and, and that was the end. I mean, I, I, I was so proud of my two meter stuff. I'd built all the two meter sources and everything. I was done. I really didn't want to hear that. Um, I wanted to do hidden transmitter hunting on two meters, but, but I listened to the wisdom of youth and said, okay, yes, she's right. Mm -hmm. And so here's, yeah, that's, that's what it looks like. That's Much one of- Much more aesthetically pleasing. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, I mean, particularly uh, for our event that we did, um, this, was, this was exactly the appropriate way to do it. Um, they're small, you can swing them around, you get this, this really good pattern. So we shifted our efforts to uh, spring 2021. So two years ago now, we shifted all of our efforts to 432 and just pretty much did everything there. Um, and one of my other hats, uh, I, I am now blissfully retired, but uh, I was an electromagnetics professor and then an analog electronics professor. And I had designed some exceptionally clean 432 antennas for laboratory work. So uh, I, I backed off the gain by about two tenths of a dB, sacrificed a little bit of gain for perfect match, 50 ohm match at the feed point, and these amazingly clean patterns. And I just, I've used that for these direction finding antennas and some things in the laboratory, signal processing antennas and whatnot. And it's just, when you aim it and you see the main lobe, that's the only lobe. The back lobe is nearly 30 dB down and then you're standing in it too. And um, we were a little worried because I was teaching a graduate um, antennas course in elect electromagnetics at the time. And we were a little worried about the fact that you're standing in the near field of, of all the elements, but especially the reflector. So Nicole needed a, an EMAG project. So she did a very, very careful study on what's the impact of having a human body in the near field of the, of the elements. And what she found is that off the back of the back lobe, it really still is a back lobe, even though this is that's a far field pattern and you're doing near field you're in the near field. So, so the, that pattern is actually just almost exactly what you get either in an anechoic chamber or when you're spinning around with the antenna. Um, and so that was a, that was a real fortunate uh, thing we discovered. So we've, we've given this presentation a couple times and, uh, and each time we've given it, people have said, oh man, that is so cool. I wanna do that, where can I get the antennas? And uh, and Anna and I have said, oh, well, yeah, yeah, they're kind of a pain. And you know, I I cut the elements on and polish the ends on the lathe to, you know, and, and they're kind of, you know, and and so for this event, Anna and I said, okay, we're gonna we're gonna put together some antennas, um, and and bring them and just have a, some of them at least at vendors' night so we can sell them if anybody wants to buy one of these things, and. Uh, so, so we did that, and unfortunately, um, I did these antennas right after I built another musical instrument, and then I've got Anna as an artist daughter, and so we really actually got kind of carried away. So, so the new the antennas we'll have at Vendors Night tonight are um, they have a a rosewood boom <laughs> with precision cut. Uh, aluminum elements, a jewelry wire folded dipole, <laughs> and 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 a uh, the the little platform that the radio attaches to. That's uh, bird's eye maple laminated onto birch plywood. <laughs> so 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 I apologize. I mean I know this is not. I mean if I showed that to Wes Hayward, i.e. Ugly construction, Wes. If I showed that to him, he would just leave the room and go hurl. Because, um, uh, but, but that's that's what happens when we, uh, uh, when an artist, uh, when an artist engineer and an engineer artist get together and come up with an. So we'll so we'll have, um, and and we ended up putting uh, a semi infinite amount of time into each one of those. Um, 
And after, after building a dozen, I said, I really, really, really do not want to go into production with these. And, and my, my daughter, Anna, came up with the, the perfect wisdom. She said, well, it's like a limited edition print. You just, <laughs> you just have a certain number of them and you call it a limited edition. And that's, that's it. So, yeah. So, all right. So there it is. Um, signal sources. I... Uh, I built a number of signal sources, and uh, uh, this is something that I didn't even want to show you what's inside, because uh, uh, for for those of you on Zoom, I'm pointing to a, a little signal source and another little signal source and a tripler. These come out on this one comes out on two meters. This one comes out on 216 megahertz and goes into a doubler. And then the most ridiculous point of all, I've always wanted to build this since when I read about it as a kid in about 1972. Um, it's a CMOS CWID that reads a diode matrix memory. And if it were, if it were sideways and blown up on that, you can actually see my call sign in the diodes. So, so that's what I built and it's, it's, a quirky arcane KK7B project, you know, kind of, if you've followed any of my articles over the years, you know, I tend to step off the path and, and do things that way. Um, it works exceptionally well. Do not copy this. This, this is the dumb way to do it. Uh, this is a perfect project for an Arduino. If you know what a tiny SA is, a tiny spectrum analyzer, you can put that into CW carrier mode, it's a very good signal generator, and then you can put it into AM modulation mode. So you can generate this, this pure tone, then put a diode ring mixer on the output, uh, key it with an Arduino, a little current from an Arduino. It's, it's perfect. Um, so don't, don't talk to me about, talk to Hans about that. Um, <laughs> talk, talk to somebody else about that, that you know, but that's the way to do it. And uh, again, 100 microwatts is about the right output level for outdoor um, hidden transmitter hunts and short distances and informal uh, radio sport kind of things. This was the disheartening one. So I did a MCW source and I wanted to do an interference source. And I thought, huh, I remember when a little model boat used to interfere with my radio. So I put I took the little model boat motor and put it in a Hammond box with a double A cell and a switch. And just in the power supply lead is a bifilar toroid and then a couple of ferrite beads going to this SMA connector on the edge. And there are a couple of important lessons to learn from this. When the cover is screwed on like it is here and nothing is connected to the antenna, all you hear is, the little electric motor noise. So shielding really, really works. If I were to put, I don't know, maybe a 10 foot wire on this and just walk up to your field day site <laughs> and, and put it in a, a bag like maybe I had picked up some dog debris uh, <laughs> and tie a knot on it and leave it on the edge of the field day site. Um, <laughs> the, the, the double A cell would last about 24 hours. <laughs> and I would, instead of when I died being judged by the quality of my friends, that's the only thing in my entire life that anybody would care about. And I would be consigned to the lowest levels of hell. Um, so so, so I, I'm telling you that to tell you how noisy this thing is. Uh, this is another thing, don't do it. Except it really is useful to have this around the shack. You can throw the, find out how effective your noise blanker is, all of that kind of stuff. So this is this is a useful thing to have. But notice um, the little uh, orange tape on the top. 
Uh, I put orange tape on so it doesn't get turned off on accidentally. I really didn't want it to come on in the baggage compartment of the airplane I was flying in. <laughs> and and because we're doing hidden transmitter hunting on 432, I, I have this really lovely little 432 helical resonator that I put between that and the antenna. So, uh, so yeah, that, that way only the narrow band that we're interested in gets through and I don't wipe out all the yeah, anybody's QRP things, even the brief amounts of time that we're gonna turn it on. Um, and with, a, with that little filter and that six inch wire, we put that on a fence post and we're able to find it 200 meters away across an open field, which I know that sounds like, oh man, that thing is really, really loud, but that's, you can find an internet router that, that far away. The, the garbage that the FCC allows us to put on the air is, is amazing. This thing is, it's hellishly awful, but it's also part 15 acceptable. I mean, that is, that's what we're dealing with. All right, so, so that's that. Um, and now it's time to uh, take a few minutes and, and show off this stuff. Um, Let's start with the uh, the little more the transmitter, and uh, go hide it in your tent. yeah, go 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 find a uh, go find a volunteer, um, and I am I've got the uh, we we tried a whole bunch of different things. We discovered that the uh, Yesu FT sixty R has exactly the right com combination of things. It's it's moderately inexpensive. And it has AM mode. It's got a real volume control and a real squelch control. And it's on. Okay, you can hear that kind of weak. Oh, I get it. There are so many internet routers and computers in this room that we can't hear. Yeah, we really need to go out in a field, but let's see, let me. So, so yeah, it, it, it actually, oh man. Yeah, when, when the signal is there, it's there, but when the signal is pointing at anything else, so, so that's that's a quick little demonstration of how it works. Um, and in the interest of full disclosure, after Anna turns that one off, I will turn this one on. So, so this is just a great way to find broadband interference sources. And 
it was, I don't know, maybe six months ago, this happened to be sitting in the corner of the shack, all assembled like this. And Anna and I were trying to make a contact on two meter AM with vintage gear, which is another one of our passions. And, and this no, big noise level thing came on and, and we were able to take this out and, and pretty quickly locate the noise source. And uh, uh, it was a power transformer on top of a uh, um, you know, power pole, I don't know, maybe, maybe about a hundred meters from the house. So, so I got out my chainsaw and uh, <laughs> So uh, let's see, we need uh, slides again. There we go. So we developed all these little antennas and transmitters and we were just having fun. It was just project kind of stuff and picnic transmitter hunts. And then the IEEE invited me to be in charge of the ham radio social event at the Denver uh, 2022 International Microwave Symposium. So 10,000 guys. There's always a ham radio social there. The ham radio social always always draws about 150 um, people. So it's a it's a popular event. So we put together this event um, inside the convention center hotel. We started off with two of the noise sources hidden around. Uh, relatively close, but outside the, the main room. So people would go and, uh, and look for the noise sources. We started off with those and uh, people were able to, to find them pretty quickly, although the internet noise routers were inside the hotel were just as loud. So people would find an internet router and then, and then, uh, um, and uh, yeah, there's a list of stuff we used. Uh, we, uh, put everything in in checked baggage to get it to Denver, and that all worked. Everybody had a blast, particularly the Portland State crew. Um, where the T? Oh, there it is. Uh, so Anna, uh, artist Anna, um, made a crew T-shirt with this <laughs> lovely graphic, and again, that uh, that became the uh, uh, one of the things that people think of when they think of amateur radio, when they read the, the IEEE materials. So, uh, uh, and if you know them well enough to know, you can just, by the way they're standing, you, you can tell that's uh, Kelly on the left and Nicole on the right. And those are the previous uh, two meter antennas. Um, so we spun off an interference hunting paper. We took it a whole lot more seriously, did a lot of measurements and wrote a paper. And so there are uh, Anna and Nicole presenting our paper um, at the Denver Microwave Symposium. And then there we are for the Tuesday evening ham radio social all lined up with, uh, with our uh, um, 10 various assorted uh, these, those were, that's before we got serious about making these things a work of art. So they were all kind of kludgy, but they worked just fine. Um, and then that's how much fun my crew had. Uh, after it was all over, they were, they were posing for these, these photos. And um, all I can say is uh, my classes were about 75% young men and 25% and young women. And the young women just thought this was cool. I don't know why that is. You, know, you can ask Anna about that, but, but it, I mean, it, it's hands-on, it's real, it's real antennas, it's real transmitters and receivers. It's, it's really cool stuff. And uh, all but one of those um, just went out independently and, and took their tech, tech license during the coast, coast of the course of this. I didn't require it or even suggest it, but it, they just, these people think ham radio is cool and they're younger than us. <laughs> and, and, and they're mostly a different gender than most of us. And if we can, if we can inject a crew like this into ham radio uh, over and over again. That really is is good for the future of ham radio. So that's 
So that's that plug. And then after it was all done, there's Anna and Nicole and I at, at uh, um, a coffee break at the microwave symposium. Uh, dozens of microwave engineers in the background. So we're, we're kind of showing off ham radio to the, the professional crowd. All right, uh, just some, you can read that. Um, <laughs> but at the bottom, transmitter, receiver, antennas, it's just basic hands-on radio. And, and it was just a lot of fun. So what's next? Well, as I was thinking about, well, why does this apply to, to QRP, to people that are primarily interest, interested in working long distances with low power CW on the HF bands? And I said, okay, well, the biggest problem for many of us living in urban residential areas is noise sources. I mean, you connect, you hook up a, a dipole outside and that's better than what a lot of us have to use, but even a dipole, the ends of that are going to droop down and be somewhere. And if you study the electromagnetic textbooks um, on antenna theory, you discover that off the ends of a dipole, there's a lot of E-field coupling. And that picks up noise from an internet router or anything with an electric motor. Um, if you're lucky enough to live out where you need animals and have an electric fence, um, you, you really don't want the end of your, your dipole dangling down near the electric fence, just because that E-field coupling off the end. So we were able to, to take our little 432 noise generate or noise directing uh, finding antennas and find a number of sources that you could solve the noise problem simply by moving the end of the dipole a little bit. So, so if you're putting up a dipole and you've got a choice where to bring the end down, bring the end down far away from any internet routers. So it's, I mean, you think of a dipole, okay, yeah, my dipole pattern is going out there and it's with noise pickup, particularly broadband noise pickup, it's often E-field coupling off the ends of the antenna. So, so that's something that we, uh, we thought about. And in practice, we've found with these little things, uh, a really noisy Apple laptop power supply in the shack. And that was, that was easy to deal with. You just unplug the supply when you want to go on the air. Um, this one was disheartening. I have this very, very high-end uh, HF receiver, my lab receiver, and uh, it's beautiful from 30 megahertz down, which is what it covers. But I discovered that when I turn it on, the digital electronics in there, the 1970s era, digital electronics has 1970s era bypass capacitors and they just don't work up at VHF and UHF. So yeah, this thing was perfectly clean on HF, but when it was turned on, it wiped out my, my VHF station. I was able to find that pretty quick. And then outdoors, uh, I already mentioned the malfunctioning streetlight and the, uh, the arcing power transformer. Um, and, uh, in, in the old days, uh, some of you are, a, a few of you are old enough to remember Gill comics. Um, and uh, there was one in my 1967 VHF manual uh, showing what happens when you connect an antenna to an HF rig and what happens when you connect an antenna to a VHF rig. And that's no longer true. Now that we've got fast transistors, better receivers, and particularly digital television. If you've ever looked at digital television on a spectrum analyzer, and now imagine anything that generates intermod, you've completely filled in the spectrum. So we've got all kinds of reasons why this is no longer true. On the other hand, there's wise old, old wisdom, and that is ignition noise. Anything that generates a spark, like the little electric motor in there, if you connect a wire to it, that's a broadband interference source. So just be aware of that. Shielding works. Um, there are some, some techniques that worked really well for AM that uh, um, now we've got noise blankers and, and there are these 
truly awful thing. The, I, I, I don't want to speak badly of a radio, but the other day I demonstrated the noise reduction on a 30-year-old Kenwood, the, the, one of the first ones that had digital noise reduction in it. And you push that button into noise re reduction. Oh, no, you're just going more away. And it sounds like a human voice and you could maybe make contact. Um, but so that we've come a long way with that too. Um, but, but anything that makes a spark that has a wire attached, you could communicate with that. I mean, if we could just go back like 130 years, we'd be famous for knowing that. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so there's some of the old wisdom that still applies. Oh, okay, and, and one last thing. All right. Um, stomach's on the air. And I need to I, I need to talk to Jerry for just a second because he he built this big rig and he says, yeah, he's not going to use it for summits on the air because the two mixers each drew 100 milliamps and that takes a lot of power and then it ended up being huge. Um, but one of the other hats that I used to always wear was I, I used to be a serious mountain climber, so I had lots of mountain climber friends and uh, two guys in particular that were just, man, they were, they were mega athletes and they knew it and they just pumped each other up. And they decided that they were gonna do a, a, a one day ascent of Mount Rainier from 6,000 feet. And at 6,000 feet, you can step onto snow and then go up to the 14,410 foot summit. And they were gonna do this and they planned it and they planned it. And uh, they, they made lists of everything. They, they had to take summit packs, which is enough gear to survive if the weather comes in and you need to spend a, a Has anybody climbed Mount Rainier in, in here? I mean, it's, it's, really, it's really serious. Um, uh, you are not going to be on summits of the air, on the air from Mount Rainier uh, just because when you get to the top, it's such a feeling of accomplishment that you really, really, really do not ever want to take out your handheld and talk to somebody sitting comfortably in a shack. Um, so, uh, so anyway, these two guys, and, and they even double checked each other's packs before they went. And then they, they got up to the summit of Mount Rainier and uh, it was a gorgeous day. It was just beautiful sunlight and they were laying back on there. And, uh, and the one guy says, oh, what I wouldn't give for a beer. And the other guy says, no, we can't drink you know, on the summit. And, and you know, we got a serious climb on the way down. You know, we can, we're not gonna mix alcohol with climbing. And the other guy says, what I want is a slice of watermelon. And, uh, the other guy says, man, that, you didn't bring a watermelon up here, did you? <laughs> and he said, no, you did. <laughs> so, so Jerry, what you need is some friends. <laughs> Get somebody to carry the rig and the other to carry the battery and, and, and you'll be good. But getting getting back to this thing, um, I hate to even say this at a QRP conference, but summits on the air. I mean, this is a five watt radio, so that's legal. Um, with this antenna, you've got fifty watts ERP aimed off. I mean, that is so much more infinitely more effective than a rubber duck that it's just not even. I mean, with with this radio on 432 FM. I mean, just switch the mode switch to FM. Now you can talk to anybody on anything you can see. So any any summit that you can see, this this will do it with somebody on the other end with with the same thing. So this is this is just kind of a cute little summits on the air rig and small enough that you can strap it to your backpack and it works. <clears throat> um, 
or you can uh, hook up your FT817 and, uh, and have a real antenna for 432 uh, sideband and CW and, and do all that. So first, uh, this started off, the whole thing started just because it looked like fun and progressed from there. It stayed in the just fun project stage with my students until IEEE got wind of it. And they invited us to do this, this IEEE ham radio social. And then sponsors kind of lined up. So I'd like to thank uh, Corvo, Portland State University, and the IEEE IMS for sponsoring a lot of this equipment development. And uh, one of the things they sponsored was letting us try out a whole bunch of different uh, handhelds uh, until we found the one that we liked best. And the FT60 just, it's, it's just perfect for this particular application. And I thought, oh man, I, how am I gonna get enough of these to do the ham radio social? And I called up the local ham radio outlet store and said, uh, I'm gonna need the uh, like 10 Yesu FT 60 Rs. And uh, the guy said, oh, we've got 17 in stock and 30 more coming next week. That is the most popular handheld in, in amateur radio. And so I said, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll recommend that. Um, so that, that's what we got. Uh, Coilcraft sent us a whole bunch of samples that I used to build like the microwave source. Um, and then there's our Portland State crew. Um, Nicole and Anna were part of the project, but each of the rest of these just thought it was cool enough that they made an excuse to make a road trip to Denver and just showed up as volunteers. And they all had a blast. Um, and then some of the photographs in here were professional photo, photos from IEEE, um, uh, Jim and Tammy Lyle at Lyle Photos. And I've been involved in that community for long enough that uh, Jim and Tammy are good friends and, and I enjoy working with them. So thanks. And uh, we'll have all of this stuff uh, a transmitter, a couple of these antennas this evening, and uh, you can try it out and, and uh, um, we'll, we'll hide the transmitters someplace uh, pretty cool. In Denver, the least approachable of our crew who was wearing a mask and had this stern expression on her, on her face, we put one of the hidden transmitters in her purse and sat her down on the edge of the hotel bar. And we let the bartender know what was going on. But if anybody came close, she would just glare at them. <laughs> and, and I will not say his name because what I'm gonna say next, um, it, it took a famous QRPer from California to actually finally come up with the nerve to approach do you have a transmitter in your backpack? Because QRPers are really annoying when they get on. The, I mean, they'll, they'll try and try and try and no matter what, they'll make the contact. So, um, so anyway, that was a lot of fun. All right, thanks a lot. Okay. So yeah, any questions? Yes. Right, right. We looked, we looked at the tape measure design. We did. We specifically wanted to do something that we could disassemble, fit in a tube, and put a dozen of them in checked baggage. And so that's, but yeah, yeah, yeah. We've looked. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if anybody's been been reading any of the magazines lately, hidden transmitter hunting is is a big deal. I mean, it's on the cover of all the magazines, and uh, and the, um, the we we kind of focused on this two hundred meters and down, you know, just picnic transmitter hunting, and uh, and what you're take 
talking about is doing it a whole lot more seriously and then taking it into the right right yes yeah yes Right. You're not sure where it is because you're kind of far away. You got a mass problem with real sharp melt. You get some of the best of both worlds, and it's real easy to put a hole that you can transport. Did you guys do anything with mox? We didn't do anything with moxons, um, but uh, probably the hardest thing for me as the old professor in the room was to say, here's what we wanna do and then back way off and, and let all the students come up with all the ideas. And, uh, and, and every one of the students came up with something that ended up in the final design. We had a few students build the tape measure antennas and uh, uh, we had some other things going on. And uh, a lot of the construction details, um, Anna actually is, is a gifted, doing things mechanically. And so, so a lot of, we leaned on you a lot for construction details. So, yes. Right. Uh, here, uh, the easiest thing to do that is just to take this back and hand it to you, and then I'll pick it from you, up from you later. Um, so this is the, this is the collapsible, go ahead and take this from me. So that's the collapsible two meter three element Yagi. And, uh, if you look in, in the tube, you'll see there's a tiny little Allen wrench in the bottom of the tube that, uh, that I use to decouple the couplers. And, uh, yeah, that, that, that actually works really well on two meters. I've, I'm still proud of that design, even though it was totally rejected by my team. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We didn't try loop antennas at two meters. They would, they would work, but by the time you get, uh, one of the reasons you use loop antennas is because they're really small for the frequency. Um, and, uh, and I've done loop antenna, tiny little loop antennas for two meters before, um, but uh, we didn't try those here. But again, as I said, this is, if you're gonna work with a bunch of people that all wanna come up with ideas, yeah, try everything. It's, it's just, it, it's really a cool project. Yeah, I'll, man, get, well, here, here's the thing. I didn't always go to the, what was it? The turtle, the hungry turtle, the hungry turtle on the edge of campus. But a bunch of these students would go to the pub after after class or whatever. And I can guarantee that there were inconceivable things that were conceived in those <laughs> <laughs> pub sessions. They, I mean, just planting this spark. Ha ha. And, and letting these students just go run with it, they had a blast. And, and probably more often than not when I wasn't in the room. 